Welcome to the work through for the September 2023 maths paper. In this paper, we are going to have a look at the questions that um, were in the paper and kind of look at the best approach to them. Hopefully you find this useful. We have selected the questions based on the type of questions that could come up. Um, and the first page of the maths paper tends to, tends to generally be arithmetic. So when it comes to the arithmetic, the first three questions um, are, or the first four questions are arithmetic and you should set them out um, using formal methods to solve. Be very, very careful to copy the numbers correctly. So we have 513 add 3,928. So be sure to line up your numbers correctly. Make sure you form your numbers correctly as well so that you can read exactly what you're adding. So three plus eight is 11, so carry the one. One plus two is three, plus the one would be four. Five plus nine is 14, carry the one across. And three plus one is four, giving us 4,441. So again, be careful that you copy those across correctly. Avoid the temptation to do these in your head or take shortcuts. These are marks you should be getting, so you want to try and get them and be as accurate as possible. So find the difference between 408 and 1031. So when we're finding the difference, we're doing a subtraction. So again, 1031 minus 408. And remember with these questions as well, if you have time at the end, you can go back and do the inverse to check your, your answers are correct. One takeaway eight we can't do. So we're going to exchange with the next column. 11 takeaway eight is three. Two takeaway zero is two. Zero takeaway four we can't do. So we're going to exchange and 10 takeaway four is six. So that gives us 623. Now for part C, you've been asked to divide 748 by 1.7. So when I teach this, I would always teach you to multiply out the decimal so that it becomes a whole number. So we're going to times by 10 to make this 17. And then we will times this side by 10 as well to make it 7,480, because the answer to the new sum, 7,480 divided by 17, will be exactly the same as the answer to the original sum, because we've scaled both sides up in the same way. So we're going to do that in a bus stop. I will do it both short division and long division. Now, because this is the 17 times table, it's probably out of your, seven, your times tables knowledge. So before beginning, I would quickly write the 17 times table down the side, up to about five times 17 to start with. So 68 and 85. If you struggle with that, the easiest thing to do there is to add 20 and take away three each time because it can make your um, arithmetic easier. So 17 will go into 74 four times. And I'll do long division first. So if we take away 68, we would then have six remainder and bring down the eight. And now 17 goes into 68 four times. Four times 17 is 68. So take away 68. You have zero remainder, bring down the zero, and 17 goes into zero, zero times, giving you the answer 440. And then we're going to come down and have a look at part D. So this time it's asking you for the product. So with product, we are multiplying. So we're going to do 42 times 13. So there are lots of different ways of doing long multiplication, but I tend to follow the more traditional one. So three times two is six, three times four is 12. We're then multiplying by the tens numbers. We've got our placeholder zero here. One times two is two, one times four is four. And when we add those together, we'll get six, four, five. So 546 is your answer here. And now we're going to clear this off and go down and have a look at question number two. So question number two, you've been told to list the following numbers in ascending order from smallest to largest. And you also have your less than signs in here. So when ordering decimals, you may find it easier to make them all the same number of decimal places. So we've got four decimal places here. So I can add a zero here, a zero here, two zeros here and three zeros here. Now, this means you can then read them as whole numbers, okay, which you're more familiar with if you find decimal place value tricky for you. And we're looking for the smallest number. And our smallest number is this one here, because this is 780 if you're reading it as a whole number. So we're going to write 0 0.078 in here. I'm going to cross that off so I know that I've dealt with it. 
The next one we have here is 0.7 because that's 7,000. So 0.7 can go in here, cross that off. Looking at the next one, it would be 7,087. So I'm going to put 0 0.7087 in here. And then this one, 0 0.78. And my last one is 0 0.78. Seven. In part B, you've been asked to find the difference between the smallest number and the largest number. So my largest number from up here is 0 0.787. And my smallest number is 0 0.078, 0 0.078. And finding the difference, I'm taking away. So leave 7 behind. 17 take away 8 will be 9. 7 take away 7 will be 0. 7 take away 0 will be 7 and zero take zero is zero, giving us 0 0.709. Now, obviously this answer here is dependent on you getting part two correct. So just be very, very careful that you've done that. So going down now to question three. So question three is dealing with indices, factors, and cube and prime numbers. So looking at the first one, which is smaller, this is important. Make sure you underline or remember what you're looking for. So four to the power of three is four times four times four, which equals 64. And three to the power of four is three times three times three times three, which is equal to 81. And therefore we're looking for the smaller one. So the smaller one will be four to the power of three. The next Okay, looking at question 3b, we've been asked to find two cube numbers which have a difference of 61. So because the difference is, is 61, it's quite large. I'm going to think about my first cube number over 100, which would be 125, which would be 5 cubed. And I'm going to take 61 away from it and see if I get a cube number. 5 take away 1 is 4. 12 take away 6 is 6. And I've got 64, and 64 is a cube number. It is 4 cubed, and obviously 125 was 5 cubed. Now, because I've asked for the cube numbers, you must give the cube numbers themselves. So I'm going to give 125 and 64. Do not write 5 cubed and 4 cubed. They are not the cube numbers. The cube numbers are 65, uh, 125 and 64. Looking at... Part C, we've been asked for the highest common factor of 48 and 144. So the largest the number could be will be 48. And we need to now just check to see if 48 goes into 144 exactly. So if I write out my 48 times table, so 48, 96, 144, it does. So therefore, the highest common factor for these two numbers is 48. Now they share other common factors like 4, 12, 24, but we're looking for the highest common factor. So the biggest number that will go into both, well 48 will go into 48 and it will also go into 144 three times. So that is our highest common factor. For part D, you've been asked to write 36 as a product of its prime factors. Now product means multiplication. So we need to write a multiplication sum using only the prime factors of 36. And if I teach you, the easiest way to do this is to draw yourself a little grid like this. And we're going to write 36 up here. And the smallest prime number that will go into 36 is, is the smallest prime number, 2. So I can put 2 here and pop 18 here. Smallest prime number that will go into 18 is 2, which will give me 9. Smallest prime number that will go into 9 is 3, which will give me 3. Smallest prime number that will go into three is three, which will give me one. And once we hit one, we know we're done. So I can now take these prime factors and write them here. So two times two times three times three will give me 36 because two times two is four. Four times three is 12. 12 times three is 36. You could also write this in index form because we have two to the power of two and we have three to the power of two. So you could also write it in index form as well. Now, looking at part E, you've been asked to find three prime numbers that will multiply together to make 385. Now, you can use exactly the same method as we used in part D. So again, I would draw my grid. And I'm going to write the number 385 up here. And again, I'm going to um, 
look to see which it, what's the smallest prime number that will go into 385 and the answer is 5 and 5 goes into 385 77 times and the smallest prime number that will go into 77 is 7 and that will give me 11 and the smallest prime number that will go into 11 is 11 itself and that will give me 1 and that has just given me the three prime numbers that will go into 385. Okay, going down now to question four. So here we have two questions, uh, three questions involving triangles. So in the first one, you're told in a triangle, one angle is three times bigger than the other two. The remaining two angles are identical. Okay, so this tells us we have an isosceles triangle and we've been asked for the size of the biggest angle. So I would draw myself a little triangle, it doesn't have to be perfect, as you can see mine isn't, and I would put my two identical angles down here and call them X, so X and X. And my angle up here is three times bigger, so that's gonna be three X. Now we know that there are 180 degrees in a triangle and we have five X's. So five X is equal to 180. And then we can work out what one X is. So to go from five X to one X, we are dividing by five. So 180 divided by five will give you 36. So that's the size of 1x. We have 3x's. So we then need to do the sum 36 times 3, which is 108. And then we can write over here 108 degrees. Now you won't be marked down if you don't put the degree sign. In part B, we're told the ratio of angle sizes in a triangle are 1 to 3 to 5. What is the size of the smallest angle? So if I teach you, I will have taught you about the ratio hashtag. Okay, so we'll draw the hashtag fill in the rat, so ratio, amount, and total. And we've got the smallest angle, the medium angle, and the largest angle. And they're in a ratio of one to three to five. We know the total number of degrees in a triangle is equal to 180, and our ratios add up to nine, and nine goes into 180 20 times. So your smallest angle will be one times 20, which is 20, medium angle, 3 times 20 will be 60, and largest angle, 5 times 20 will be 100, and when we add those together, they come to 180. They have asked us for the size of the smallest angle, so we can look here, and we can see it's 20 degrees. Okay, in part C, we've been told the areas of the triangle and the rectangle below are equal. What is the height of the triangle? So we have all the details for the rectangle, so this would be 10 and a half times 6, well, 10 times 6 is equal to 60, and a half times 6 is the same as a half of 6, so that would be 3. So altogether, we know our area is 63 centimetres squared, and that will be the same for the triangle. And to calculate the area of a triangle, we would do base times perpendicular height, so this line here, divided by 2, and we need that to equal 63. So we can then do the inverse, we can do the reverse. So we would then, instead of dividing by two, we will times by two to give ourselves 126. And we know that the base is nine. So we can do 126 divided by nine. And that will give us one, carry three, 14. So our height of our triangle will be 14 centimeters squared. Uh, the height of our triangle will be 14 centimeters. So just remember, the formula for the to find the area of a triangle and if we know the area we can do the inverse we can work through the equation in the opposite direction to find our missing value for the height coming down now to question number five so here we have nth term and function machines and i'm just going to shrink this down a little so we can get more of the question on the page and if we look at number five, we're told Harry is completing a table of values for the formula 5n plus 7. She has completed the first row of the table and you need to find the two missing values. So you will get one mark for each of these values. So be careful not to miss these exams here. So uh, these questions here. So remember n stands for the term number. So when n is 13, for this one, we would do 5 times 13, which is 65. And then we would add 7 to give ourselves 72. And here we've been given the value for 5n plus 7 equals 112. So 5n plus 7 
equals 112, so we'll do the reverse. So we will take away 7, which will give us 105, and divide that by 5 to give ourselves 21. Down here, we're given some more information. We're told Megan decided to use a function machine to complete her own two-step calculations, where the input is multiplied by 6, and then 14 is subtracted from the total. The function machine works like this. So you put the number in, you times it by 6, you take away 14, and you get your answer out. And that's called the output. You could also, if you reckon, this is also another way of doing um, nth term, but using a function machine. So we could also write a, a nth term formula for this. It would be 6n minus 14. And we'll just keep that up there in case we need it later. So here we've been asked, what is the output if Megan uses 15 as the input? So Megan puts 15 in and she times this by 6, which will give us 90. And then she takes away 14, which will give us 76. So going down to part C, we've been asked what the input is if Megan's output is 124. So we can write our mystery number times 6 minus 14 equals 124. And we're going to do the inverse, walking back through the equation, doing the opposite each time. So 124 add 14 would be 138. And instead of timesing by 6, I'm going to divide by 6. And 6 goes into 13 twice, carry 1. And 6 goes into 18 three times, meaning our answer is 23. And you can try that. 23 times 6 will give you... 138, take away 14 will give you 124. Okay, coming down to D. This one is asking you for which value would Harriet and Megan both achieve the same value? Harriet would use this number for N and Megan would use this number for as, as her input, that should say, so as her input. And the formula for Harriet, so Harriet is 5n plus 7, because we have that up there. The formula, if you remember, we wrote here was 6n minus 14 for Megan, and they need to be equal. Okay, so if I teach you, we draw a line down the middle here, and we would keep all of our n's on one side, our unknown numbers, and we would keep put all of our known numbers on the other. So if we highlight these here, we're going to put all of our n's on this side. And we are going to put all of our numbers on this side. And you need to remember that when things cross the equal sign, they do the opposite. So if we come down here now, put my equal signs in. So on the yellow side, I already have 6n. I'm going to bring positive 5n across the equal sign, so it will become negative 5n. And on this side, I already have positive 7. I'm going to bring negative 14 across the equal sign where it will become positive 14. And 6n minus 5n will equal 1n. And 7 plus 14 equals 21. So my answer here would be 21. You can test it as well. So 6 times 21 would be 126. Minus 14 would give you 112. And on this side, 5 times 21 would be 105. Plus the 7 will give you 112. OK, so that if you want to test that your answer is correct, you can do that as a means of checking at the end. OK, coming down and looking at question six. So question six, we have a pie chart and Jared decided to record the 30 hours he spent revising for his end of term tests in the chart below. So this is a key piece of information at the top here in that he spent 30 hours. OK. And in the pie chart, we've been given percentage for English. We haven't been given any details for maths. We've been given degrees for French and no information for history and science. So what fraction of the time was spent revising maths? Well, what you need to identify here is the fact we have a straight line going down the middle of the pie chart. And maths is on this side with English. And if English is 30%, this is half of the circle, so maths must be 20%. And we can turn 20% into a fraction by making it 20 over 100. And we can simplify that by dividing top and bottom by 5 to give us uh, 4 over 
20 and we can divide again by 4 to give us 1 over 5. Okay, so 1 fifth. What is the size of the angle? So this time we're looking for the angle for the sector representing English revision. Now, obviously, pie charts are a circle. All circles have 360 degrees. And we know that English is 30% of the circle. So we need to find 30% of 360 degrees. And the easiest way to do that is to find 10% by dividing by 10, which will give us 36. And then to get to 30%, we would times that by 3 to give us an angle of 108 degrees. Looking at part C, how long did he spend revising for French? Give your answer in hours and minutes. Well, French we know is 45 degrees, and that will be 45 degrees out of 360 degrees. We can simplify that down to 1 eighth, and he's going to spend 1 eighth of his 30 hours. Now, 30 hours, to find 1 eighth, we would divide 30 hours by 8. Um, you can do it that way, or remembering we've got to find hours and minutes, we could turn 30 hours into minutes. So 30 times 60 minutes in an hour will give us 1,800 minutes, uh, which we can divide by 8. So 1,800 divided by 8. 8 will go in twice, carry 2. 8 will go in twice, carry 4 and eight will go in five. So that's 225 minutes. We can change that back into hours. So 60 minutes would be one hour, 120 would be two, 180 would be three hours, and we would then have 45 minutes left over. Okay, so that's what, there's different ways of doing that, but if you want to, um, if you're doing anything involving minutes, I would change the whole thing into minutes as well. Now, if Jared spent an equal amount of time revising for maths and science, what percentage of his time was spent revising for history? Well, maths, we know, was 20%. Science, if he spent the same amount of time revising for science, he would have spent 20% of his time on science here. For the French, because we know it's 1 eighth, 1 eighth is equal to 12.5%. So we know that there. So we now have the percentages for for, uh, four of the sectors so we can work out the fifth because the whole sector would be 100 percent so we've got 30 50 70 82 and a half percent is accounted for so if we take that away from 100 percent we would end up with 12 uh, 17.5 percent of his time was spent revising for history now um the other thing if you aren't sure how I got the 12.5% here, um, the, the way I did it was 45 uh, out of 360 is 1 eighth. You can turn 1 eighth into a percentage by timesing by 100 over 1, which would be 100 over 8. And then you could do 100 divided by 8. It's not going to go in exactly, so add a decimal point. 8 goes into 10 once, carry 2, 8 goes into 20 twice, carry 4, and then you get your 5 there. So that's how you can turn any fraction into a percentage. Okay, coming down to question 7. Um, here we're dealing with rounding and boundaries. So we've been told that a whole number, A, rounded to the nearest 100 is 700. And a whole number B, rounded to the nearest 1,000, is 2,000. So this is a two-part question. Sometimes these can be four-part questions. Um, but regardless, it's still worth doing the work at the outset in order to ensure the accuracy of your answer. So I would always recommend when you're dealing with boundaries, you do the work at the front of the question so that you've got all the information there and you just need to use it. So A, rounded to the nearest 100, is 700. So the smallest number that could have been rounded up is 50 less, would be 650, because remember we start to round five and above. And the largest number that could be rounded down would be 749, and that would give us 99, a gap of 99 between our largest and smallest. And whole number B, rounded to the nearest 1,000 is 2,000. So the smallest possible number that could be rounded up would be 1,500. 
and the largest possible number that could be rounded down is 2,499. And we have a gap here of 999 between these two, which means we know we're correct. And now we can look at answering the question. What is the largest possible value of A? Well, looking here, I can see it's 749. What is the smallest possible value for B minus A? Now, when we're taking away, if we want a smaller value, we need our numbers to be closest together. So in this case, we would like the smallest number from B, and we're going to subtract the largest number from A to create our smallest difference. So we would do 1,500 minus 700, oops, let me just line that up properly, minus 749. Now, zero we can't do, so we're going to exchange, exchange and leave nine behind. 10 take away nine is one, nine take away four is five, and 14 take away seven is seven, giving us the answer 751. So coming down to question eight, this question deals with 3D shapes, properties of 3D shape, and overlaps with mean, mode, and range as well. So what is the name of the shape with the smallest number of faces? Well, the shape with the smallest number of faces is this one. This has four faces. This one here has seven. This one here is a cube, so it has eight. And this one here has four triangular faces at the top, four at the bottom, so it has eight as well. So the shape with the smallest number of faces is this one here, and this is a tetrahedron, okay? Also known as a triangular-based pyramid. I would not accept triangular pyramid because all pyramids have triangular faces. So please make sure if you're going to answer it as a triangular, triangular-based pyramid, okay? That would be the acceptable answer. I would not accept triangular pyramid because that is incorrect, okay? What are the average number of vertices per shape? So vertices are created when two straight lines meet. So effectively, they're the corners. And on our tetrahedron, we have one, two, three, four corners. On our pentagonal prism, we have five at the front here, and we have five at the back here. So we have 10 vertices. On our cube, we have four at the front here, and we have four at the back. So we have eight vertices. And on our octahedron here, we have a vertice, we have a vertex at the top, one and two, and then we have one, two, three, four around the middle, so we have six vertices here. So to find the average, we need to add all of these together. So that comes to 28, and then divide by how many there are, and that is four shapes, and that gives us our average number of vertices is seven. What is the modal number of edges for all the shapes above? So looking at our tetrahedron, first of all, edges, we have three edges around the bottom and three edges at the top. So they have a total of six edges. For our pentagonal prism, we have five edges at the front, five edges at the back and five edges joining. So we have 15 edges here. For our cube, we have four edges at the front, four edges at the back and four joining edges. So that gives us a total of 12 edges. And for our octahedron, we have four edges around the middle. We have four edges at the top and we have four edges at the bottom. So we have 12 edges. So therefore the mode, the most frequent number is 12. So that's our modal number of edges here would be 12. So here we have a cube net and we're looking to see which of the, which of the cubes on the right can be made from the cube net on the left. So you're looking for shape here. So if we look at A first of all, if we had the cross, we could have the cross with this at the side, but we wouldn't have the exclamation mark at the top. That wouldn't work. Looking at B, if we had the cross at the front, the T would be facing in this direction. So this is looking good. And the four would be on its side facing down. So our answer here would be B. OK, so that's we've actually found that one. We found it before we had to investigate all of the others. But if you needed to, you could investigate those two. Just be aware of the orientation of the shapes you have been given. OK, and also which faces can actually um, could actually be touching um, and visible from the angle that they've been displayed. So your answer here is B.
Okay, coming down now to question nine. Here we have fraction calculations. So here you've been asked to calculate the following given the answers in their simplest terms. Now watch out for this. If they specify simplest terms, it must be given in simplest terms. If they don't, you won't have to. Now, in for the last couple of years, they haven't been looking for simplest terms, but it is something they could introduce um, to check how accurately you're reading the question. So just watch out for that. If they ask for it in simplest terms, it must be given in simplest terms. Now to add fractions, they need to have the same denominator and eight and five will both go into 40. So we can create two new fractions over 40. And to go from eight to 40, I have times by five. Whatever I do to the bottom, I must do the same to the top. Three times five is 15. To go from five to 40, I have times by eight. Three times eight is 24. And when we add those together, we come up with our answer 39 over 40. That can't be simplified. For our next one, we're doing subtraction. Again, they need to have the same denominator and the lowest common multiple for four and six is 12. So I'm gonna create two new fractions over 12. To go from six to 12, I've times by two, five times two is 10. To go from four to 12, I've times by three, one times three is three. And 10 twelfths take away three twelfths will give me seven twelfths. So again, no need to simplify because that's already in its simplest terms. Now I'm doing three and one fifths divided by four. So because I'm dividing a mixed number, I'm going to get it into an improper fraction. So this is going to become three times five is 15 plus the one is 16. So this is gonna become 16 over five. And I'm going to divide by four and I can turn my four into a fraction by putting it over one, divided by four over one. And remember for dividing fractions, we keep, change, flip. So we're gonna keep the first fraction as it is, change this to multiply, flip this upside down. And we're now multiplying fractions. So six times one is 16. Five times four is 20. And 16 and 20 can both be divided by four to give me four over five. Okay, so four fifths. So looking at question 10, Eamon is facing north. So if we draw a quick compass point, okay, so it doesn't have to be anything fancy. We just draw that there. And remember your order. OK, so we've got, let me just, I'll just draw that again. Hold on. There we go. So we've got north up here, never eat shredded wheat. So between north and east, there is 90 degrees. OK, and between east and south, there is 90 degrees. There's 90 degrees between each main compass point. The halfway sort of northeast, there would be 45 degrees between northeast and north. Um, and we're told that he turns clockwise 135 degrees. So turning clockwise 135 degrees, he's starting at north. 90 degrees would take him to east and 135 degrees will take him to southeast. So he's moved to the south to a southeasterly position here. We're then told that he turns anti-clockwise through 180 degrees. So let me get that up in a different color. So he, this time he's starting from his southeasterly position. He rotates 45 degrees to here, 135 degrees to here, and 180 degrees to here. So this would then take him, so he's facing in a northwesterly direction. And the question asks, how many degrees away from north is Eamon's final compass position? You would always go the shortest route. So he, to go from northwest to north, would be 45 degrees. And that should be your answer there. Looking at part B, um, we've been asked which of the letters below have rotational symmetry order two. And for this one, I've actually put two possible scenarios on the mark scheme because Technically, S has rotational symmetry order two, but looking at the format of this S, I think the top could be, you could argue the top is slightly smaller than the bottom, in which case it would only have rotational symmetry order one, but N will definitely have rotational symmetry order two. So in order for this one, if you thought it was S and N, I would accept that. If you thought it was N on its own, I would accept that. If you thought it was S on its own, I would not accept that because 
North is clearly has rotational symmetry order two at 180 degrees. It would land on itself. S, depending on how you see it, I thought it did have rotational symmetry order two. Another one of my markers disputed that. So that's why there is um, a dual option on that question on the answer sheet. Coming down and looking at part C of question 10, here we have a jug and three fifths of the water in the jug is poured away. How much water will be left in the jug? So if three fifths of the water in the jug is poured away, that means we will have two fifths of the jug uh, of the water in the jug left. So we now need to work out how much water we actually have in the jug to start with. So we've got three litres. 3250, 3500, we've got 3750 milliliters. Okay, so 3.75 liters. I'm going to divide that by five and then times by two. So five goes into 37 seven times and carry two. Five goes into 25 five times. That gives us 750 milliliters. So that would be equal to one fifth is 750. I'm trying to find the value of two fifths, so I can double that to give myself 1,500. So just make sure you've read the question carefully so you fully understand that there. And coming down now to question 11, here we have a cuboid and we have been asked to find the volume. You've also been told it's not drawn to scale and volume is length times width times height done in any order. So the sum we're doing is seven times two times three. Well, seven times two is 14 times three is 42. So it will be 42 centimeters squared. We've then been asked for the surface area of the cuboid. So with the surface area, remember with a cuboid, the front and back faces will be the same. So this face here will be the same, will have the same area as the back face. And we can work out this area here. This would be seven long by three high, which is 21. And we can times that by two to account for the back as well, giving us 42. We can then look at the top face. Now the top face will be the same area as the bottom face. So we can do, look at this here. And this is seven centimeters long by two centimeters wide which would be 14, and I'm going to double that to account for the bottom, so that will give me 28. And then the last face I'm gonna look at is the side face. So this side face down here, okay, so this is two wide by three tall, and two times three is six, and I'm gonna double that because the other side will be the same, so that gives me 12. So I'm now adding 42, for my front and back faces to 28 for my top and bottom faces to finally 12 for my left and right faces. And when I add those together, they come to 82 centimeters squared. So coming down to have a look at question 12. So here we have, we're told that on the scale below, the blocks inside and outside of there are blocks inside and outside of the bags. Each of the bags below contain the same number of blocks. If each block weighs 150 grams, what is the weight of one bag of blocks? For this purpose of this problem, you may assume the bags weigh nothing. So we know each block weighs 150 and each bag contains the same number of blocks. So looking over here on this side, Scale is balanced perfectly, so we know they both weigh the same. On this side, I have two bags. So two bags, and I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven blocks, and seven blocks. And on this side, I have one bag, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten blocks. Ten blocks. So the difference between this side and this side is equal, two bags take away one bag will equal one bag. And going this way, 10 blocks take away seven blocks will be three blocks. So therefore, my differences are three blocks and one bag. So one bag must have three blocks in it and three blocks at 150 each. So three times 150 will equal 450 grams would be the weight of one of the bags. Now, like coming down to question 13, 
here we have a word problem that requires you to write an algebraic equation. We're told that Jensen bought six Pokemon cards and two match attack cards, which cost £6.90. So I can write Jensen equals 6p for Pokemon plus 2m for match attacks equals 690 pence. I'm then told that Oscar bought three Pokemon cards and three match attack cards, and that cost him £4.95. And I've been asked to find the price of one match attack card. So in order to do that, because I don't know the price of the Pokemon or the match attacks, I'm going to make the Pokemon cards the same. So I have six Pokemon cards here. Three will go into six. So I'm going to change this to six. And because I've changed this, I need to change these by the same factor. So to go from three to six, I times by two. I'm going to times this by two to make this six. So I must now double £4.95, which will be 10p short of £10, so £9.90. So my Pokemon cards are the same. So there's zero Pokemon cards. The difference between my match attack cards, six take away two is four. So I've got four match attack cards. And the difference between my money is 300 or three pounds. So four match attack cards will cost three pounds. So to find the value of one, I would divide 300 by four to give me 75p. So one match attack card costs 75 pence. And you can double check there if you want to. So two match attacks, two times 75 would be 150 pence, which then means we take that away. We'd have five pound 40 for the six. So they'd be 90p here for your Pokemon cards if you needed to find that out as well. OK. So best way to do those is to write those algebraic equations, make one side the same and then you can work it from there. Okay, moving on to question 14. Here we're told that an e-scooter is reduced by 30% in the sale and its original price costs £425. What does it cost to buy in the sale? So in order to do this, we need to work out what 30% of 425 is and then we can subtract that from the original amount. So one way of doing, there are lots of different ways of finding percentage of amount. Because we're dealing with a multiple of 10, I would find 10%. Now to find 10% of a number, we divide by 10. So 10% will equal 42 pounds and 50 pence. And to find 30%, to go from 10% to 30%, we are timesing by three. So if we do 42 pound 50 times three, and we'll go three zeros, a zero, three fives, a 15, carry the one, three twos, a six, plus the one is seven, three fours, a 12. We have 127 pound 50. We now need to subtract that because we're reducing 425 by 30%. So do 425.00 minus 127.50. And zero take zero is zero. We're going to borrow here and come across, 10 take away five is five. Four take away seven, we can't do. So 14 take away seven is seven. One take away two, we can't do. So we're going to exchange here. 11 take away two is nine. And three take away one is two, giving us 297 pounds and 50 pence, which we're going to copy, uh, we're going to copy over into our answer space. So 297, Make sure the decimal point is nice and clear, 50. I'm going to clear this off now because, hang on, let me just move the screen down a little bit. Move it up. Okay, so looking down at part B. In part B, a skateboard has been reduced by 20% in the sale and now costs £44. We need to find the original price. So if I teach you for this, we always remember that the original price is equal to 100%. If we've reduced by 20%, we've taken 20% away. So we've been left with 80%. And we know that that 80% is equal to £44. The highest common factor of 80 and 100 is 20%. So we'll pop that in the middle. And to go from 80 to 20, we have divided by 4. And to go from 20 to 100, we have times by 5. Now, 44 divided by 4 will give us 11. 
and then 11 times 5 will give us 55. So the original price was 55 pounds and 10% of 55 pounds would be 5 pound 50. And so 20% would be equal to 11 pounds. And if we take 11 pounds away from 55, we would get up, we would get back to our sale price of 44. So it's possible to check your answers as well once you have done them. Coming down to question 15, here we have a ratio question. And the reason we know it's ratio is when amounts are compared to other amounts in fixed parameters, we can use ratio and proportion. And again, this would be another good chance to use the hashtag rat ratio thing here. So we'll draw our hashtag. We're going to put in R for ratio, A for amount, and T for total. We can use column headings of C for Catalea. E for ME and N for Nova. And we're told that Catalea gets a quarter of the amount that ME receives and ME receives half as much as Nova. And we're being asked how much does ME receive? So in order to do this, we need to work out who receives the least amount. So Catalea gets less than ME and ME gets less than Nova. So Catalea has our smallest amount. So we will give her a value of one. She gets a quarter of the amount that Emmy receives. So Emmy would get four times more. So she gets four. And Emmy receives half as much as Nova. So four is half of eight. So uh, Nova's ratio share would be eight. And when we add all those together, they come to 13. The amount we're sharing is 117. And 13 will go into 117 nine times. So we're timesing by nine. So we can now come and times the ratios by nine. So one times nine is nine. 4 times 9 is 36, and 8 times 9 is 72. And when we add those together, they come to 117, so we can check we've shared them correctly. Go back and check what the question was asking. So how much does Emmy receive? And the answer to that is £36. Coming down to question 16. Question 16 involves bid mass. So with bid mass, we would always do the brackets first, but we've got um, an X in the brackets here. So we, when we did this, if we were doing this sum from this side, we would do this first. Then we would multiply by six. Um, we would also solve our indices here to give us nine. And we would add this nine on last. So this would be done last. OK, so going in reverse, starting with 51. Instead of adding 9, we will take away 9, which will give us 42. Instead of timesing by 6, we will divide by 6, which will give us 7. And instead of minusing 2, we will add 2, which will give us 9. So we're walking our way back through the question doing the inverse. So here, x is 9, and we can try that by putting x in here. So 9 take away 2 would be 7. 6 times 7 would be 42, and 9 plus 42 will give us 51. So coming down to question 17, we have our conversions. OK, so we're doing some measure conversions here. And we've been asked to, uh, to convert kilograms into milligrams. So to go from kilograms to grams, one kilogram equals 1,000 grams and one gram is equal to 1,000 milligrams. So to go from kilograms to grams, we've gone from one to 1,000, so we're timesing by 1,000. And to go from grams to milligrams, we've times by 1,000 again. So overall, we're timesing by a million. So we need to move our decimal point six decimal places. So I would rewrite the number here, 0 0.0108, and I'm going to move decimal point forward six places because I'm multiplying. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Decimal point lands there. And I can fill in my placeholder zeros here. And we have 10,800. So copy that over carefully, making sure you've got the correct number of zeros. Now to convert milligrams to kilograms, we're doing the opposite. We are dividing by a million. So again, I would rewrite my number. So 18808, put my decimal point here. 
And this time I need to move my decimal point back six places. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Add the decimal point here, put your placeholder zero in here and your zero here to give you 0 0.018808. Okay, so make, try and make yours a bit clearer than I have there. So looking at part 17C, so here we're told we have a rectangular mirror with a length of 1.2 meters and a width of 750 millimeters. And we've been asked to find its area in square centimeters. So the way I would always teach this is I would recommend you draw yourself a rectangle. OK, and we have been given our length in meters and our width in millimeters and they want the area in centimeters. So we can convert first of all. So our length would be 1.2 times 100 would be 120. To convert millimeters into centimeters, we divide by 10. So this becomes 75. So our sum will be 120 times 75. And it always makes sense to do it in the unit that you need to give the answer in. So five zeros are zero, five twos are 10, five ones are five, plus the one we carried over will be six. Placeholder zero, seven zeros are zero, seven twos are 14, carry the one. Seven ones are seven, plus the one will be eight, giving us 9,000 centimetres when we add those two together. Looking at... Part D, we have a rectangle, and this time, so again, I would draw the rectangle. We've been told that the area is 196 centimetres squared. So we know the area. We know the length is four times greater than the width, and we've asked, been asked what the length is in centimetres. So I'm going to call my width W. My length is four times greater, so I will call that 4W. And to find area, we would multiply W by 4W. So 4W times W will be 4W squared, which is equal to 196. So if I leave W squared here, I can do 196 divided by 4. OK, by bringing this 4 across, multiply by 4 will become divide by 4. So W squared is going to equal 49. So we then need to find the square root of W. So the square root of W would be seven. So my width is seven. My length will be four times that. So my length will be 28. So your length here, you've been asked what its length is in centimeters and the answer is 28. So coming down now to question 18, this question deals with the mean or the average. So we've been told that six family members were celebrating Woody's birthday. Their ages were 16, 18, 28, 43, 45 and 72. What is the mean of their ages? So to find the mean, we need to add them all together and then divide by six. So I would recommend pairing them to start with. So we're going to go 34, 28, add 43 is 71 and 45 add 72 is 117 and then we can add them again so 34 add 71 will be 105 and 105 add 117 will give us 222 and we need to divide that by six so i'm going to pop that in a bus stop 222 divided by six six goes into 22 three times carry four and six goes into 42, seven. So our average age is 37 years old. And that makes sense because it's somewhere between the smallest age, of the youngest age of 16 and the oldest age of 72. Here we're told Woody is celebrating his 16th birthday. If Woody's age is added to his family's members ages above, what will be the new average of their combined ages? So we can take our 222 that we have from part A and add 16 to that giving us 238. And because we've added Woody in, we're now dividing by seven people. So 238 divided by seven. Seven goes into 23 three times, carry two, and seven goes into 28 four times. So the average is now 34. Okay, coming down to question 19. This is about coordinates without a coordinates grid. 
So we've been told we have a square ABCD. Okay, so square ABCD has the coordinates A is 3, 7, B is 6, 7, C is 6, 4, and D is X, Y. And we've been asked to find the values of X and Y. Now, you can do this in a lot of different ways. So if you drew your square, and let me just change my pen color, um, and we could have A would be 3, 7. So this would be A here. So this is 3, 7. B is 6, 7. So we would have gone further along the X axis to give B being 6, 7. And C is 6, 4. So again, we've gone along to 6 and we've gone up to 4. So C would be here and it would be 6 along the X axis, 4 up the Y. So point D is this point here. So point D's X coordinate is going to be in line with point A. So it will have an X coordinate of 3. And point D's Y coordinate is the same distance up the Y axis as C. So it will have the same Y coordinate as C. So that will give us 3, 4. So if it helps to draw it out, you can do. There's another way you can do this as well um, with a square um, and also with a rectangle as well. You're looking for coordinate pairs. So if you look here, we've got 7 and 7 pair off. 6 and 6 pair off for the x. So we need a pair for, we need an x pair for 3 and we need a y pair for 4. So that's another way of doing it there, seeing which ones are left and that will tell you the ones that you need. Now what would the coordinates of A be if the shape was reflected across the y axis? So if you imagine, if we drew an axis here by our square, if you like, if we're reflecting across the y-axis, remember the y-axis is your vertical axis and the x-axis is your horizontal. If we're reflecting across the y-axis, this shape will end up over here and it will be the same distance from the y-axis on this side as it is on this side. And they want to know the coordinates of point A. So point A would move over here. So point A, the y-coordinate would stay the same because it would still be at seven on the y-axis. But the x coordinate, instead of being positive 3, like it is on this side, it will now be negative 3 on that side. So it will be negative 3, 7. So again, feel free to draw these things should you need to. Looking at question 20, we're told that Edward has a 5,000 savings bonds that pays 5% interest every year. How much interest will he earn after one year? So a nice quick way of doing this is 10% of 5,000, we would divide by 10, would be 500. And to find 5%, well, 5% is half of 10%, so we can halve 500, so it will be 250. So this one here, so they only wanted the interest amount, not the new amount in the account, just the interest. <clears throat> if Edward does not withdraw any money, how much money will he have in his account after interest has been paid at the end of the second year? So in the first year, he had 5,000. At the end of the first year, we added 250 to that. So at the start of the second year, he had 5,250 pounds in his account. Now, 10% of that would have been 525 pounds. So 5% would be half of that. So it will be 262 pounds 50 which we can add onto the, the the balance at the start of year two. So if we add 26250 on here, so we've got 0.502, 5 plus 6 is 11, carry 1, 2 plus 2 plus 1 is 5, and we've got there. So at the end of the second year, his balance will be 5,512 pounds and 50 pence. Going on to part C, at the start of the year, Edward withdraws 10% of the original amount to spend when he's on holiday in Portugal. He converts the money into euros at an exchange rate of euro 1.15 for one pound. How many euros does he have? So if I teach you um, currency conversions, I teach you to do it as ratio. So we'll do some column headings here. So pounds to euros, one pound is equal to 1.15 euros. And if he withdraws 10% of the original amount, the original amount was 5,000, so he's withdrawing 500 pounds. 
To go from 1 to 500, we have times by 500. So we will do the same on this side. 1.15 times 500. So if we times by 100, that will become 115. And times that by 5, and we will end up with 575 euros. So that would be your answer there. Okay, on to the final section. So here we have question 21. So this is angles. These are all angles around a point. So recognizing angles around a point. So angles around a point will form a circle and a circle has 360 degrees. So in order to find A, if we add 72 and 154, so if we do 154, add 72, that will give us 226 which will subtract from 360 to give us our angle A. So that's 4, 3, 1. So 134 degrees for angle A. Again, we have angles around a point here as well. So this one we know is 90 degrees and we have 117 here. So that gives us total number of known degrees of 100 uh, 207. So if we do <clears throat> 360 degrees minus 207, because we added the 90 and the 117 together, that will give us 5, 10, 3, 5, 1. So 153 degrees. Okay, coming down to question 22, this one involves a bar graph. I'm just going to shrink it down a little bit so that we can get the bar graph and the questions on the page. So here we have, we're told the chart below shows the number of children per household on a new estate. So on this axis here, we have the number of households and across here we have the number of children per household. The first thing you could do if you wanted to is put your totals at the top of your bars so that you have them there and you're able to do the maths, make sure you read the scale. So this bar here is halfway between 20 and 22, so we'll be 21. This is halfway between four and six, so we'll be five. This will be three, and this will be one. So part A, how many households had one or no children? So this one, one or no children, we're only interested in these two bars here, and they add up to 20. In part B, how many households had more than two children? So more than two children, we're only interested in these three bars here, and that adds up to nine. So we don't include the, ch the households with two children, so we're only interested in more than two children. How many children are there living in the estate? So to work that out, we would times the number of households by the number of children. So 12 times zero is zero, eight times one is eight, 21 times two is 42, five times three is 15, three times four is 12, and one times five will be five. So if we add these together, we get 50, 65, 77, 82. So your answer here is 82 children. What is the number, what is the average number of children per household? Well, we know that there are 82 children in total. And the number of households we can get by adding these numbers up here. So 12 plus 8 is 20, plus 21 is 41, 46, 49, 50. So the average number of children per household would be 82 children divided by 50 households. So you haven't been told to give your answer as a decimal or um, a mixed number, so you can choose. So 82 divided by 50, 50 goes in once, and we would have 32 fiftieths left over. And this can be simplified down to 16 25ths. So you could have one and 16 25ths. You could also do it in a bus stop. So we have 82 divided by 50. So 50 will not go into eight, will not go into eight. 50 will go into 82 once, and we will have a remainder of 32 add your zero, 50 goes into 326 times, and we will have 20 left over, so we carry that over and add another zero, and 50 goes into 200 four times to give you 
1.64. So either one of those answers would be acceptable. So I hope you found the September mock useful, um, recapping a lot of core concepts, and I wish you all the best in your upcoming exam and look forward to hearing how we got on.